Good morning, Saints. Well, it's been about a month since I did a little Bible study, and I thought um, this might be a, an interesting follow-on. It, it's a follow-on to a video I did last month about the eternal state. And for those that don't want to go you know, watch two Bible study videos here, I'll just recap. I was making the argument that that the eternal state isn't Revelation 21 and 22, that those chapters are really about the setup of the millennial reign or the millennial kingdom. And we got into it, um, but I'd say the core argument, if you want to just boil it down to one argument, is there's verses both in Revelation 21 and in 22 that talk about that outside the city, and presumably that's New Jerusalem, there's whoremongers and idolaters and whatever. And, you know, if you just read, <laughs> I'll read Revelation 20 that takes you to the end of the great white throne judgment and every, you know, sinful thing and wicked person, whatever, is thrown into the lake of fire. So how can you get to Revelation 21 and 22, see those verses about, outside of the city being whoremongers and you know wicked people and all that if everything bad has been thrown into the lake of fire there's a logical disconnect and and yet that's that is uh it's the majority view it definitely is if you <laughs> if you look at commentary you go into commentary in revelation 21 or revelation 22 it's generally depicted as this is the eternal state and yet you know like i say there's a problem there and i think even positionally the the dialogue around the new heavens and the new earth for instance um, you can see sort of a timing conflict with that stance if you go into i think it's isaiah 65 where he's talking about the new heavens and new earth and then he gives that description of the, you know, I forget if it's the lions laying down with the lamb or if it's the kid in the, the playing in the den of the asp or whatever. But he's tying the new heavens and new earth to the regeneration is the way I'm going to talk about it, of the earth. And that is a description of the millennial reign, not the end of the millennial reign and eternity, but really during the millennial reign and the eternity. And the position in Isaiah, I think it's 65, where he says new heavens and new earth, what preceded that was judgment type verses, then it's the new heavens and new earth, and then it's this idyllic, idyllic um, view of earth. And so positionally, when I look at those, well, here it is right here. <laughs> I use these slides to teach when I teach eschatology, and they've been modified and updated over time. And so, you know, if if anybody watching this video has seen older videos from me with a slide deck, you know, some of this stuff shifted around as you deep dive into it. But in general, I've been teaching this for at least two or three years, that New Jerusalem comes down and the new heavens and new earth exist at the setup of the 1,000 year reign not at the end as part of the eternal state and for some of those reasons given so you know the last video i went through a bunch of verses gave you the logical argument as to why <clears throat> uh, sin can't be outside the city if you're in the eternal state and so i'll leave you if you want to watch that you can go into it reason why I did this video is really it 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 was prompted by brother Barry Scarborough he he has a pretty popular channel on YouTube and he preaches the gospel and he's looking for the coming of the Lord and all those good things and he said something which is consistent with the common view of Revelation 21 and 22 being in the eternal state but he almost made my point for me <laughs> And so it was it was interesting that you know the Lord kind of brought that to my attention and let me just show you so he, what he was looking at was 
this sort of famous line in Matthew 24, but concerning that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. <clears throat> and he was, I believe he was making the point, and, I, and uh, I, I think it is the correct interpretation. Matthew's gospel is to the Jewish people. And so here you have an idiom that's very Jewish. No one knows the day or the hour is that Rosh Hashanah um, Feast of Trumpets reference. As they spot the new moon, <clears throat> it has to be declared by two witnesses, the whole nine, so no one knows the day or the hour. It's the kickoff of of the, um, well, Rosh Hashanah's head of the year. It's the kickoff of the, uh, you want to say, secular calendar. The Lord reestablished his calendar, you know, starting with the, the month that Passover is in. But here we've got, Rosh Hashanah being pointed to. And again, if this gospel and all your commentaries will say Matthew's gospel is for the Jewish people. <laughs> so keep it in context here. This is Rosh Hashanah. And what's he talking about? No one knowing the day or the hour of the coming of the Son of Man. The, the antecedent you know, topic is the, the appearing of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of earth will mourn. This is the second coming. When does it happen on Rosh Hashanah? <clears throat> and so I just want to make that simple. And here you have the lesson of the fig tree. And in Matthew's gospel, the fig tree speaks to the, the Israel. And you go to Luke's gospel, which is more wired toward the Gentile or Greek world. And he doesn't just say fig tree, but he says, and all the trees. And so you can see the separation there in the Gospels between the Gospels for the Gentile slash Greek in Luke and here the Gospel to the uh, Hebrews. So we've kind of got that pegged. We're at, we're at the second coming time frame. We're at the Rosh Hashanah time frame. And what Brother Barry pointed out was the prior verse Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And what he was trying to do is, is you know, put these verses in a frame saying it couldn't be the rapture of the church. <laughs> right on, brother. <laughs> I agree. Uh, it's the second coming. What's odd is when he backed up to say heaven and earth will pass away, he said, well, see, that's, that's after the millennial reign. And I know why he said that. That's because your commentaries will all take you to Revelation 21 and 22 when the new heavens and the new earth, you know, Revelation 21, are referenced in the text. And most commentaries take you that that's an eternal state view. And so <clears throat> I just want to show you this. The new heavens and the new earth, the new Jerusalem coming down uh, as a bride, that's all referenced in Revelation 21. And so, and well, in Revelation 3 there, but for new Jerusalem. But I, I'm arguing it's at the setup of the millennial reign. And um, the prior video will give you the context for why those descriptions can't be in the eternal state. And now what I want to do is give you a context why new heaven and new earth is really not the wiping away complete you know material removal of heaven and earth but it's it's a, a regeneration of heaven and earth because the old one's going to be so singed after the seven year tribulation period that there needs to be a renewal now, put on your thinking caps, your logic. We know that only believers are going to get into the kingdom. And, you know, there's lots of passages that go with that. But um, Ezekiel 20 and Matthew 25 speak to the Jewish people getting into the kingdom, as well as a ton of uh, 
Old Testament texts and whatever. And then you got the tribulation saints um, that also, you know, and the Old Testament saints and the tribulation saints that also go into the millennial reign. And what's is God then going to set up, <clears throat> set up, set them up and say, come enjoy dwelling with the Lord, you know, the concept of Feast of Tabernacles. Does he say that <laughs> after the end of the bold judgments, for instance, where, you know, all the oceans have turned to blood and what two thirds of the earth has been burned by fire and, you know, a hundred pound hail, burning hailstones have fallen on the earth. And, you know, go, go back and read <laughs> the bold judgments, right? What shape is the earth in after all that's happened? Does the Lord return then and say, come and enjoy, <laughs> come and enjoy the millennial kingdom where the lion lays down with the lamb <laughs> when there would be dead bodies, you know, from the Armageddon piled high and the blood would be running down, you know, however many miles from from the Valley of Megiddo down to I forget what the terminus point of that is. I think it's the mountains of Basra, right? No. <laughs> there, when the Lord returns, that's the new heavens and new earth. It's going to be a regeneration. And so, and then the new Jerusalem comes down as the dwelling for the saints. You see that in Revelation 3, 12. So I just want to make this point then. I love Brother Barry Scarborough, and he did take the popular view, read your commentaries, he was talking about that phrase um, and putting it into the popular view. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Many commentaries will take you to the eternal state, heaven and earth passing away. Why? Because the new heavens and the new earth are talked about in Revelation 21. But just to kind of flip that on its nose, hopefully, I want to first look at the dest the destruction that heaven and earth passing away part and see that it's a reference to the tribulation period not literally where where the material that <laughs> that God formed to create heaven and earth dematerializes that's you know a lot of people go to that based on some of the um almost hyperbolic language hyperbole, sort, I think that's right, language used um, in the apocalyptic literature in, in, in the Bible. So let's take a look at some of these popular verses. First of all, I want you to know that the last days, men will laugh at the truth. They will follow their own desires. They will say, you promised to come. Where is he? Since er, uh, early fathers died, everything is the same from the beginning of the world. But they want you to forget that God spoke in the heavens were made long ago and the earth was made out of water and water was all around it long ago the earth was covered with water and destroyed well was it destroyed like removed like it doesn't exist no it was it was destroyed from an, from habitation right but the heavens we see now and the earth we live on now has been kept by his word they will be kept until they are destroyed by fire they will be kept until the day men stand before God and sinners will be destroyed. Well, there. Isaiah 24. See, the Lord will lay the earth waste. He will destroy it. Again, does that mean the actual material substance of the earth is removed and it's void in space again? It will turn his ground upside down. He'll send people everywhere. What happens to the people will happen to the religious leader. What happens to the man servant will happen to its owner. The woman servant will be like her owner. The buyer will be like the seller. The giver will be like the receiver. The one who lets another use his money will be like the one who uses it. All the earth will be laid waste and destroyed, for the Lord has said it. The earth cries in sorrow and wastes away. The world becomes weak uh, with sorrow and wastes away. Together with honored people of the earth, the earth will be made unclean by its people. They have sinned and not obey the laws. They have broken the agreement that was theirs to be forever. So the earth is cursed and those who live in it will suffer guilt. So the people of the earth are burned and few men are left. So there's the destruction. It's not a complete removal. 
it sure sounds like the tribulation period, right? When the wicked are punished. Okay. All the stars of the heavens will waste away, and the sky will be rolled up like writings. When does that happen? Revelation 6. And the, and the heavens rolled up like a scroll, right? Beginning of the tribulation period is the context. All of them that are in the way, away also. As the leaf dries up from the vine, or as one dries up from the fig tree. Zephaniah, so wait for me, says the Lord, for the day when I stand up to speak, I've decided to gather nations together, pour my burning anger upon them. All the earth will be destroyed by fire of my jealous anger. So, again, not materially removing the earth, but the earth will be consumed in fire. And let's just see that the point is, the punishment of the people on the earth and the destruction by fire, but it's not a complete removal of the substance of the earth or the substance of the heaven. It's a it's a judgment thing, just like the flood, the comparison we had earlier here, was a judgment against those on earth, but it didn't remove the earth, okay? <clears throat> so let's take a look here. He built his sanctuary like heights, like the earth he established where forever and so again if you're looking at commentaries you're listening to people on YouTube we're going to go through a bunch of passages now that say the new heavens and new earth doesn't mean literally the substance of earth is removed and something new is formed in its place it's a regeneration of the earth generations come and generations go but the earth remains forever Psalm 148, praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise his name of the Lord, for at his command they were created, and he established them forever and ever. He issued a decree that will never pass away. Well, there, there you go. It's not a complete removal of either the heaven or the earth. It's going to be a refreshing the righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. So now coming back, I think hopefully just with that little peak. And again, there's tons of passages in the Bible. I tried to just sort out some that speak to this destruction of earth and destruction of the heavens. So that you can see it's talking about the tribulation period. It's not talking about the actual physical elements that make up the earth, they're completely removed. It's talking about, you know, the, the judgment during the tribulation period. And so if you combine this with the prior video where we say you can't take, you know, Revelation 21 and 22 to be part of the eternal state, it's only got one logical home. It's the refreshing, the new heavens and new earth is the refreshing of the heavens and the earth after the tribulation period where in Revelation 6 the skies roll up like a scroll, the earth is destroyed by fire in the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments. That, that is the context for the destruction of the heavens and earth requiring a new heaven and a new earth to be formed. And I'd suggest if you want to really dig into it more, go read all of Isaiah 24. You see that, you know, this that's the context, is the judgment of the earth, is this notion of the earth being destroyed by fire. And that gives you a context to the full Second Peter 3, where the elements of the earth are melted by fire as well. It doesn't mean it's a complete removal of the heavens and earth and then some new creation happens, it means the existing heaven and earth are somehow going to be recreated. And then all those passages about the lion laying down with the lamb and Christ dwelling as king with his people, you know, for the millennial reign, <clears throat> fulfilling the Davidic covenant, fulfilling the land grant to the Jewish people, the Abrahamic covenant, that all has to happen. Would God give the the Jewish people, the land grant, 
the 12 tribes promised the land from the Euphrates River to the Nile, would he give it to them after 100-pound flaming hailstones had devastated the earth and after, you know, the outpouring of the bold judgments and think about the Mediterranean Sea, which was so precious to them, would it be filled with blood, right, if, if there wasn't a refreshing of the heavens and the earth? And so it just logically has to be that the new heavens and new earth are at the start of the millennial reign. <clears throat> and God's actually giving us a little bit of context then, and I thank Brother Barry for pointing that out. When does it happen? <laughs> Well, it's right at the timing of the second coming, the coming of the Son of Man, and then the heaven and earth have passed away, but his words are not going to pass away. Actually, I, I'd be honest, saints, you know, it's like one of those verses that you read it a thousand, thousand times, and it has no, I thought this was just a comparison, right? <clears throat> this generation shall not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. I thought it was just one of those play on word comparison kind of things. I never actually saw this verse as that notion of the heavens and earth passing away, but it, it makes total sense. And, and to check, you know, I went into a commentary. Now, this, this isn't definitive in and of itself. You gather all the scriptural evidence to, to make some of these judgments. But I was just looking at this John Gill commentary. This is either an assertion which will be true at the end of time, not as the substance of the heavens and earth, which shall always remain. Well, if we just looked at those passages. But as to the qualities of them, which will be altered, they will be renewed and refined, but not destroyed. And that's the point I was trying to make. Is you know, Scripture is clear that the actual heavens and earth will not physically you know, be removed somehow and then a brand new planet called Earth be created and a brand new heaven will will be created. It's really, it's a renewal, it's a refreshing. So I'd like to leave you there, saints. I hope this was a blessing. Like I say, this, this video kind of fits in or is an addendum to the, the eternal state video I did last month. So God bless saints. Keep looking up. I mean, what more do we need to see, right? I mean, Wow, with with everything that's going on, Iran threatening the U.S., threatening Israel, which is, you know, just more of the same in terms of the ratcheting up of the tension and all the other crazy things that are going on with the conflicts with Russia and China and, and everything else. I mean, I don't know when the Lord's going to come, saints. I, I, I gave up a little bit on... on uh, the day by day, I won't say hand wringing, but the day by day um, fixation on the Lord's return, I kind of got myself into a mode of He's coming soon. There's no doubt. <laughs> Stuff stuff's all there. You can see it, but you know, endless guessing about the actual day isn't helpful. And um, I don't know. I I think for me, it's like live. Live your life day to day, trusting in the Lord, fulfilling what he's called us to do. And when he comes to take us and we know it soon, you know, he'll find us working, working for the for the kingdom's benefit and uh, not sitting here, you know, absorbing our time in, in uh, endless speculation. You do, and I want to be real clear on this. You learn a ton about the Bible, studying the day of the Lord and the rapture of the church and the second coming. That, no doubt. I mean, it's almost a third of the whole Bible is this topic. So, you know, I, I never feel bad about the time I invested. And I don't feel like uh, anybody should feel bad about actual doing the Bible study component of learning these things for themselves. I think the downside is looking at too many videos that are just, um, let's just say they're, they're non-Bible focused speculation kind of videos. And I'll let you discern that for yourself. Um, there is a huge benefit and a crown that goes with people that look for his coming. But how do you separate that from, 
you know, such a, a focus, not on the scriptural text, but such a focus on the concept of his coming for the church that somehow you lose your commission, you lose what you were called to do, and you, you lose, you know, context for, you know, walking out your your faith in a day in day out basis. I've walked over that line a bunch of times, but you know, I also give all the glory to the Lord that He's forced me to try and find this in the text for myself, and it's just such a huge blessing when you can understand the full end of Scripture and not leave a third of the Bible out because you don't want to touch that topic, right? So. I praise I praise the Lord for how He called me and for what He's shown me, and it's just a general warning that if that isn't the focus of your study, you know, the coming of the Lord isn't the focus of going into the Bible and learning it for yourself. Um, just watch, watch, watch out, saints, because you don't want to get distracted from your calling. God bless.